Welcome back to the Tacoma Beast channel where it's all about the taco. On today's video, we're going to be doing a build walk around the Fab Force Tacoma. This is one of the most incredible Tacoma builds I've seen. If you guys have seen a Tacoma build crazier than this one, then please share it on the comment section down below. I would love to check it out. With me today is Greg. Greg so is the owner and founder of Fab Force. How's it going, man? Good. You ready to do a walk, uh, build a walk around this thing? Yeah, welcome to Fab Force. Let's do it. Let's do it. So tell me, Greg, why? Why was it that you decided to take on this challenge and build this beast? Well, okay. Wasn't ready for that, so I'll give you just the unbridled answer. Okay. Part of the passion for this is just what I love about off-road. And over the years, just building Fab Fours brick at a time, it's always been in the pursuit of kind of the next toy. Now, some of those toys are in the plant floor. You know, the more capacity we have, the more it opens the doors for us to be creative in product development. And by that, I mean faster cutting lasers, you know, seven axis back gauge, LED quick change, press brakes. You know, those are big boy toys for production, but they're also just giving us a capability to I let my mind go crazy. I mean, like you see in the tube doors we're gonna talk about here, you can ask 100 people to sketch a tube door for a Tacoma, they're all gonna look the same. They're gonna think, ah, tube door, I've seen those on Jeeps, and draw the same over and over and over. I go tube door, you're gonna get some wild ass, unpredictable thing. And that's kind of what I love to do. I, you know, I wanna challenge people's imaginations and you see with the big Fab Fours builds, whether it be a Dodge Ram with a Viscount, a Grumper, or a totally tricked out Jeep or Gladiator, I get the testimonies from those customers that are like, man, I can't even pump gas. It can't go anywhere without people taking pictures, asking me, what is that? What in the world am I looking at? And that's what I love. That's the, literally the vision from the beginning is building big toys where it should look like something that would be in a sandbox. Yeah. So the proportions are a little off. It's enough to catch your eye and be like, wait, what size tires are those? Like, that looks ridiculous. Yeah. No, and, no. and as soon as I've made somebody ask that question, I feel like we've won. Yeah. Because now their juices are flowing like, oh my gosh, that must have been so hard to do. And like, does it work? And what, what do you do? I love that dialogue. So in a way, all of what you see here, this 146,000 square feet, the last 20 years of my life, it's still in a pursuit of kind of that spark of energy that just puts a smile on people's face. Dude, that's awesome. And why did you decide to go with the Tacoma platform? Why was it that, is it, I've seen you build Jeeps, you build, I don't know what that thing is. <laughs> it's a crazy Chevy Colorado. That's one crazy ride. What was it that inspired you to start with the Tacoma? Why the, the 2019 Tacoma? We already were doing development for products we needed. And at Fab Fours, one advantage we have is we buy every truck. So we don't borrow vehicles for test fits and things because it makes you cut corners. You know, it's such a hard thing to go get one, not damage it, borrow it. Once you put your prototype on and said, ah, man, I wish we could tighten up that face. Well, Fab Fours, we will walk in the door 30 feet away, redesign it, send it to the lasers, that afternoon we can put another prototype on. Because we have all the resources in-house and own the cars, we're gonna get the perfect bumper. Well, we needed a Tacoma. I love the fact that those are like 40 grand for a super sweet loaded one. Because we're used to buying Platinum Super Duties and King Ranches, $80,000 pickups. This felt like a steal to get an awesome TRD, top of the line, truck for you know mid 40s yeah. and when i did it nobody realized what i was scheming but there was a reason i got it in the manual because in the back of my mind it's like maybe we might build this and if i did build this there's no way i'm wheeling something with ifs because i'll break it yeah. so if i was going to do a solid axle swap i've been down this road before all the wheel speed sensors and all the the, the things that piss off a modern truck you know, they're gonna throw it into limp mode, the transmission gets pissed. Everything that has a sensor on it normally gets angry if you're gonna do a build of this magnitude. Yep. So since I had this in the back of my mind, found the 19 Taco, which is a little harder to find, in a manual, just knowing that's one less system because it doesn't have sensors. Yep. It doesn't care whether you're in first or third gear. 
We're just gonna have to deal with everything in the IFS. So that's why it was this truck. I really, really like to keep as much factory running gear as possible because I've done that stint with big motors, you know, big loping cams. You could put something sweet in a taco, but that all leads to gremlins. And I want something that's going to just work. So having a brand new, no miles truck with the manual, it had everything in the makings to become a taco that harkens back to my first truck because I just had the single case 4.7 gears in that old manual 83 of mine. Loved it, could go anywhere, felt comfortable putting it in crazy predicaments. But I've always been jealous of the guys that had the double transfer cases. When you go like a 4.7 and a 4.7, those guys can get out and walk next to that rig while it's on the trail. I've never had it, I always wanted it. So I kind of felt like all those years of pent up jealousy for those slow crawling rigs, yeah. it was coming together right. and, and I could kind of pork barrel it in to a project that we needed to have anyways for some of our product development. It was a perfect excuse. A perfect excuse. And that's all I needed. So I convinced our sales and marketing team, this would be a great rig, trust me. Yeah. Like the gearheads are gonna freak out for it. <laughs> We're already strong in Tacoma anyways. We can get a double whammy. We'll have this thing for the big show, for Easter Jeep and for SEMA. So let's go ahead and the fact that I had some donor parts, you're kind of getting a half price build because these are big tickets. I mean, this is easily a 50 to $60,000 build above the truck. But sorry to the, that's the Reaper, right? I'm unseating him. I'm gonna say this is now the baddest Tacoma on the planet. And you can't disagree, try. I mean, it's got everything from crazy interior, sound system, unbreakable Dana 80 axles, 43 inch tires. You, are, you actually have someone that might be challenging this truck and it's, uh, I don't know if you've seen him on Instagram, Spartan X Taco. Are you familiar with that guy? Is it a real truck? Because I feel like I saw a rendering of a tan no, one. No, it's real. We actually ah, video okay. On it. it's, uh, it's called a $100,000 Tacoma. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see those these two trucks go hand in hand. But uh, Hey, up until this point, this one, this one is. That sounds like a call out to me. Oh, I'm in. Is this happening? Anytime, any place, baby. What are we gonna do? I mean, whatever you can do, I think I can do better. Because you gotta go fast, she can go fast. I can still cruise down the highway at 65, but I doubt you're going low, low. So when it comes to a technical crawl, man, we've got some experience and the goods underneath that thing. And I mean that in total positive jest, so it'll be good stuff. Everyone loves to see a heads up competition, kind of like why we built this against our Gladiator. I mean, those are two super popular platforms for overlanding. Let's dig into the truck. Let's start talking about parts. What did you guys uh, go with for wheels and tires? Wheels and tires. So they're Dirty Life beadlocks because we needed to have a legitimate beadlock to be able to air down. You know, I love seeing a tire wrinkle and I'm a tire guy. I mean, if you look over my shoulder here, I've got 400 tires yeah, because that was a, a bucket list item of mine. I wanted to design my own tread. Oh, no, and those are it? That's it, the Fab Fours Chimera tire. I drew that from scratch. We've had them made, paid for the molds, imported the tires. You go back one SEMA ago, the Baja Pro X, they had one tire sitting in the booth and that's their sticky version, the X version of this. Yeah. People went ballistic for it. And I said, look, you're taking a page out of my book. This is what you do. Like you have a $50,000, $80,000 booth. Nobody cares. Everyone's walking to this one prototype tire because this tire just said, there are no rules. We don't care. We're just gonna do something ridiculous. And people thrive on that. And so I'm, I said, I will have the first set of those tires. So when the vision for this truck came together, the timing was just about right. I called Ben and said, look, what are you working on? I want something nobody can get that's ridiculous because this taco is gonna be number one. And it's like, we've got the Baja Pro, but the DOT version. All right, done, that's perfect. That's what's on, the that's what's on it. It's a 43 inch Baja Pro, which is a too big tire. You know, I have to admit. And what, si what size? It's a 43, 
15.5. It might say 14.5, both of which are bold lies. It's like a 17 inch wide tire, <laughs> which is awesome looking, but that is a lot of tire to turn in a wheel well. So there's actually a, a chance, truth be told, when we really go get this thing in the rocks, it may prove that it needs a second set of shoes for hardcore rock crawling that are smaller. Okay. So in order to fit these tires, what suspension system did you decide to go with? What, what is it currently rocking? Yeah, so what it has is not available. You can't buy it. It's a one-off suspension made by Adam over at Southern Off-Road. So they wanted to go with a triangulated four link where you've got normally the upper links going to the top of the diff and the lower links either going out or straight. And that's what keeps the axle centered, but allows full articulation. Problem with that is packaging. You see that more often on a purpose-built buggy where you're starting from scratch, you've got the chassis, the drivetrain, and you can do whatever you want. When you're trying to kind of retro into a brand new truck with factory running gear, I mean, you're not, re, you're not repositioning the motor in this thing. You know, that was not gonna be the scope to cut off the motor mounts, move the motor back two inches. You can't do that. It's, you pop the hood and took that picture, it looked like you're on Auto Trader looking at a 2019 Taco. Yeah. It's the same. It's perfect, unmolested, and reliable, short of having a reservoir for the steering. So when he's got those constraints, he had to work around all that, but still try to give us a performance. So it's a combination of massive cutting to make the wheel wells bigger, and now a three link front and rear with pan hard bar that handles suspension duties then paired with ORI struts. So the ORI struts, you know, to this day, I call them black magic. You know, it's some, I wanted to actually buy that company because I believe in the product so much. And I can't even tell you how it works. But if you're familiar with building suspensions, a traditional Jeep, uh, you know, it would have a coil up front and a shock and a bump stop. Now you get a little bit more hardcore, maybe you swap that to a coil over where there's an internal shock with coils on it, but you've got spring loads where you might have a 400 pound coil on the bottom, a 250 on top and a tender spring. Hard to set up because you really got to get the weights of the truck and all that. A strut is amazing. It integrates the suspension duty of holding the vehicle up, flexing, the bump stop, and then here's the real kicker, sway bar. So normally when you have a coil over or a coil, your factory truck or aftermarket ones have a sway bar. And what that's doing, if you're on a side hill and the body's trying to roll on you and freak you out, it gets stopped because that sway bar is having to tweak. And so it's keeping the truck there. Yet when you need it to articulate, you just you overpower. Well, it works because you overpower it, but when it's, if it's well set up, it's tuned to where it's gonna keep you from rolling. Well, you have to do that with aftermarket, anti-rock sway bars from Curry, that type of thing. That's all packaging, packaging, packaging. This strut, it's all in one. How it works, I do not know. Because you're charging the top and the bottom of the strut. It's like when it tries to roll, its own internal pressure is fighting that roll. That's crazy. So from a, a plumbing of it, and same thing you see when you try to integrate like air bumps to a four link, you're a lucky man if you've catted it properly to where when you take a jump and you land, the bump spots hit one spot. But at the same time, when you're articulating and the axle does this, does that bump stop hit in the same spot? The answer is no, super rare. So it's hard to get both in one. Well, by having a bump stop integrated to the strut itself, all you need is a eye mount up top and eye mount on bottom, and it's always there because it's in line. So it's an amazing way, and you can tell in our other video how big a fan Adam became of those. Because as a builder, you're trying to do all this virtually and lift the truck on the forklift and see you know, how the components line up. So this is Adam from Southern Off-Road. Southern Off -road. He's yep. the one that helped you build this. Yep. This thing. Solid, solid job from Adam. So with this current suspension system that you have, the tires, what's the total lift on this thing? Uh, that's a good question. So basically, I was trying to pick the ideal truck height, being reasonable. You know, the lower the vehicle, but the bigger the tire, for me, always cooler. There's no limit. 
I would love to have a 50 inch tire and a 70 inch roof height. That is sick looking, but it doesn't work. And, and stable as well. Super stable, but it's hard to have that and articulation and travel to where it's a comfortable ride. You know, versus hard mounting axles to the chassis, you're gonna get beat to death, but it would work because it's low. So in this case, I constrained Adam by picking the bed height at just around five feet, which, so we had, I had it here on the lift and I was just raising and lowering the body to try to get that feel, wheeled over some of my other 43s, and then you can kind of just get the proportions to go, yeah. If that can work, that is sweet. So to answer your question, I don't technically know. You know, you would have to go say, hey, where's the bottom of the frame on a factory rig? Yeah. And where's the bottom of the frame now? I'm gonna guess though, it's the equivalent of a eight inch lift, six to eight inch lift. And in order to fix the tires, how much cutting did you have to do? All the cutting. All the, I can't imagine. <laughs> how much? All of now, it. One thing that is crazy is that your frame, the cut that you guys did on your frame is the standard frame cut. Which, but it's because of your lift. Because which you would know that better than me. Because yeah. uh, you immediately called that out, which is awesome. I, mean, I love seeing you know, the normal taco community yeah. modifications integrated into this one. Yeah. And what you're pointing to was the front body mount, and it makes sense, you know. But higher than that, you guys did chop off. A oh, all the way into the wheel well. Chunk, I was like, dude, that is crazy. This was full Fred Flintstone style, yeah. where you can sit in the seat and look down at the ground. That's how much firewall was cut away. Oh, wow. Which, then you gotta go and plate it all back in, and it's very custom to pull that off. But given the size tire, we had to go firewall side and bumper side. That's why they took our matrix and essentially cut six inches of our, you know, fabricated sheet metal away and then had to recap our bumper because you just had to make that wheel well huge. And what about those uh, uh, fenders that you guys added? Is that also custom made as well? Yep. So Adam being a longstanding customer of ours that builds tons of trucks anyways, he's done some of our no lift 40, open fender trucks on the heavy duties. So that's a full turnkey package we offer to be able to run upwards of a 40 inch tire on a Super Duty or a Dodge with zero lift kit. So the kit includes a lot of cutting and then our replacement fenders. So what he was trying to do was mimic the style of our base fender and he did a phenomenal job. Oh, yeah. So it looks, if you line this one up next to a Dodge and a Super Duty of ours with our no lift fender, it would look like it was part of the family. So we achieved that goal, but it's not something that we intend to make available quite yet. We'll see. See how many views this thing gets and who knows, maybe the taco needs an open fender system. Let us know in the comment section down below, are you guys interested in those fenders? Let's go ahead and talk about your armor. Let's talk about your front bumper. That overland bed rack is looking incredible, man. You guys absolutely killed it with that. And uh, what you guys have for your rear bumper. This is actually a matrix shown. So this is one of our newest versions and kind of the culmination of our years of experience of combining both high and tight and winch. Hard to have both. You know, typically in a winch bumper, it's gonna to start to just push the front out and out and out because of a packaging, et cetera. Well, we've mastered getting it super high and tight, almost to the OE envelope while still pulling off mounting a winch. What's the total weight on that bumper, do you know? I'm gonna put that one, I mean, at least it's a mini truck, so it's a little bit smaller of an overall carcass. It's probably gonna come in around, it'll be on our website, but I'm gonna guess 95 pounds without the winch. I, I, I know that, I'm just thinking about, you could carry it. Now, and it also has the option for around two pods in the front? Yep, so the surrounds to the lights are actually removable, and we've come up with a really cool way to do that. That's why they're red on this one you can actually remove those tunnels and paint match them any color you want to offset. But we pulled it off without having any exposed fasteners, which is pretty cool. Wow, so cool. it's got some cool bracketry in the back that lets you set one side and then it's engineered properly to preload it against with the bolt mechanisms. So it's not gonna rattle or move around, but yet not have bolts coming through the front. And it's easier to install the, the pods, right? Yep. It looks super clean. What about the sliders? I know that those are custom. Yeah, so this is in development. Given the timing, I just yanked a set of Gladiator sliders for the Jeep and sent them to Adam. 
knowing that it's approximately good enough and I just needed protection if we were going to head out to Moab. So we couldn't have all the development time, but we have to have something. The slider is critical if you're going to go in the rocks because that's way too expensive a fix. I don't mind a little dent in the bed or something, but if you get into that door jam, forget it. You know, door's never going to close right. Sliders are critical. So we're going to end up with two different versions, probably a bomber but inexpensive tube style slider that we've done for the jeeps and one like this which is kind of a more integrated step with slider that can hold rock lights inside but the, the rears are available so again we've got complementary rears for each one of those front families a vengeance style a premium the premium would go with the the different matrix fronts as well and then the overland rack so the gladiator it's kind of what spawned that, you know, for us. Like we knew Overland was already gaining traction. The Jeep Gladiator was gonna take that to a new level where it could kind of have that uh, trophy, or the camel trophy look with the old limb risers. Well, Tacoma, right there with it. We know that that's gonna, it's huge already. You go to Colorado at some of those jamborees and Overlands, you're gonna see a lot of tacos. Oh yeah. Cause it's a great platform. Yep. And it had a bed before the Gladiator ever did. So if you're into that, you know, you gotta carry a lot of gear and that's hard to do even in a traditional Jeep inside in the back. So I think Tacoma's already had a real loyal following to that. And while there's racks available, not really our way. Our, we go robust. You know, when we build a rack, it's as bomber as a bumper. Dude, that Overland bed rack has enough space to put a, a pretty big uh, tent up there. Yep. The biggest. The biggest. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they've made them now in a couple different lengths. So it's between a two person and a four person tent. This one can hold any of the tents that are on the aftermarket right now. That's awesome. From a length. It's looking really sweet. And it's got options to put two pods on each side, right? Yep. And there's some on the back. All right, let's move over to lighting. I know that you have a lot of rigid industries on the truck. You're right. It's rigids for all the cubes that you see everywhere. And then it's pro comp for the rock lights which is pretty trick. Uh, even in the whole background here, I've got it on us circulating through all the colors, which is fun because I've never had the RGB lights. So I geek out over some of that stuff. And again, when Fab Four shows up, I want you to know it when we're a hundred yards away. So the base is your first cue, like, wait, who is that? Yeah. And then you look, you're like, what, what is that thing? And so that's phase two. Yeah. Now I've captured your imagination with the proportions are just out of control. And then phase three, once it gets close and you start looking, you're like the finer details and the nuances to the build. Yeah. So lights, man, that's just bringing the party, particularly at night, obviously. And you've just got all the undercarriage, which is good for wheeling. You know, you want that visibility. But in this case, Adam gave me a surprise by the kicker speakers that are in this thing having LEDs also integrated. And I don't think he knew that until he plugged them in. <laughs> but so now you've got the whole center console, all the speakers in the doors, and all the undercarriage rock lights are all on the same switch and RGB controlled by your phone. So you can have purple, red, green, super cool. And then the rigids are the Radiant series. Smartest thing rigid ever did. You know, for years I've been asked just from buddies and customers alike, like what light should I put in there? It's like, all right, here's the deal. One, we're made in the USA. I like US companies, you know, leave the cheap junk for the other low cost bumpers. Rigid's the way to go. You know, we want top brands. You got Warren Winch, Rigid Lights. These are the partners that we use all the time. But the problem with Rigid's, super expensive. As our Fab Fours bumpers, you get what you pay for. It's got all the quality. Twice a year, you find yourself on some back road and you're like, yes, he turned my lights on that I spent $2,000 on. That's not enough. But the Radiance, what that basically means is they're backlit. So you can get them in red, blue, green, and yellow so that the pod, in our case, they're red backlit. During the day, you can leave it on while you're in at a restaurant. It's awesome. You can't just be blinding everybody while you're sitting there in the parking lot. But having those backlit red is huge. And so, I push everyone into the Radiant series that I can for that very reason. It's a light you can use every single day, not just those two times a year out in the woods. 
And when you need the white, they've got that too. Dude, let's move on to uh, your axles. Yeah. The one thing that makes this Tacoma absolutely different from every other Tacoma out there. What are you rocking for the axles? So those are Dynatrack Pro Rock 80 axles, which is just gnarly. Insane. Insane. Does each one of those cost? Well, the pair of them was a little over 22 grand, and that's with them helping, helping a little bit too. Now, some of that is, you know, I knew I was gonna beat on them even when they were into the Jeep. It's just the idea, like peace of mind, and it's just kind of cool to show people like that's the pinnacle of what the aftermarket industry has come up with. Dynatrack's got a long, reputable brand, and the Pro Rock series, which they have in a 44, a 60, and an 80, is kind of their cream de la creme. So this is the top of the top of the food chain from a big, robust ring gear, but then you're even taking that upgrade and upgrading it. So you see the big orange bells showing inside the C's at the, at the wheel ends. Those are RCV inner axle shafts. That alone is over a $2,000 upgrade, but they come with a lifetime warranty up to something absurd, like 50 inch tires and a thousand horsepower. Yo, to some insane numbers. Now you see that they've also got a PSC Ram. So it's full hydraulic steering on the front which the difference there, you know, the Toyota mini boxes, if you take an old school one that's got a steering arm, it was very common to port those to have hydraulic assist, which I think is pretty necessary once you start going above a 37 inch tire off-road. As you start airing down and get that contact patch on good traction ground, you will not be able to steer factory steering. It's just gonna whine and not turn. Well, steering's your pretty much number one tool at conquering an obstacle. So I love hydraulic assist, but assist is just more components to package. You know, you've got to get the box in the actual spot you need it on the frame so that the arm's in the proper location for the geometry. So now you've got a drag link and you've got a ram. That all has to go in there, work through the full suspension cycle. Now, if you're willing to risk the slightly less street legalness, AKA 100% not street legal, and jump to full hydro, packaging became simple. Now you've got to mount a little orbital anywhere up in the engine compartment that you can get the steering shaft to. Then it's all soft lines down to a ram, and that ram has all the power no matter what bind you get in Dude, to steer it. Incredible. So it's a cool way to go, but you're committed. When you go full hydro, you're now you know, you're not gonna roll up to the inspection station in Southern California and pass, most likely. But if you live in South Kakalaki and there is no inspections, no problem, because it's not like somebody's gonna see that and call it out. We were just talking about your axles. Putting those things on, I can't imagine what it did to your dashboard as far as it looking like a Christmas tree. How were you guys able, able to overcome that? Well, that again is the power of Adam and Southern Off-Road. So if anyone could do it, I knew it'd be him. We went into it eyes wide open. Every one of us knew that you're not gonna have wheel speed sensors, the ABS stuff's all gonna be pissed off. It's not gonna like any of it. So he had a guy that can get in, crack the computer and find all those things. So that was our mission to not have one dash light on. You know, not the little slippery ABS, nothing. And sure enough, there's not one light. So none of that works. I mean, don't kid yourself. We don't have an ABS system yeah. functioning. But, you, but you're not really needing it. Perfectly. No, it's, I mean. What about the speedometer? That's another one that Speedometer? I this thing. Does your speedometer work? It works, but it is not accurate. It's a little bit off, I'm guessing, because of the tire Just tire size, so you know. Still, it's still moving. So, I mean, come on, Adam. Can't get the speedometer right, but it's all right. I've <laughs> self-calibrated to know using GPS in the phone, like, all right, 50 is actually 58. Just, okay, so it's only off by like eight miles. Yeah, it's not that bad. Okay, just like my Tacoma, actually. Nope. So, that's not bad at all. But yeah, to have it fully functioning, not angry, and in no way in limp mode is pretty amazing. Because yeah. I want to commute in this thing every day down here on pretty weather. And you can do it 
but you're getting some vibe that you can absolutely tell is wheel and tire driven. If it wasn't on that, so we're gonna run a second set of Fab Fours and 40s that can balance out. I promise you this thing's gonna ride as smooth as any Tacoma you've ever been in. And even those struts on pieces of road that I know how all of our trucks behave, like where you told me to take a hard hit or going over the railroad tracks, thing is so smooth. So it shifts perfect. You know, it's a hard thing with hydraulic steering is getting the scrub just right. Because if you don't have the camber of the axle just right, you can get in a scenario where you turn right, hydraulic steering, it goes right. Now the truck goes right. So you turn left, it goes left. And you're just doing this constantly. Super irritating. Oh, like there's a little bit of lag, you say. Yeah, the hydraulic steering, it, it's dumb. It only knows where it's going. And so if the axles are set too neutral, I've had a rig like that and it's actually dangerous because you start getting in the, start yeah, it's just back and forth. This one, you can eat a sandwich in there. You know, one finger driving. And so it's just set up right to where if you get just enough scrub where it's towed in and the axles aimed down, it's trying to find center all the time. So it's not so much it's gonna wear the tires down, but it is enough to keep that manageable. So I love the way this thing rides. 100% functions properly. What about the Toyota safety sensor up in the grill? Is that working properly as well? Or do you not have... What is that supposed to do? So that's basically for the cruise control. Oh, like an adaptive? Yeah. Uh, there's no cruise. No, not, not on this old grill. I don't think so. So you guys definitely must have uh, sacked it. Yeah, that's on the, the cut list. Well, at this point, you're not going to be cruise controlling your way through the rocks, you know? No. Now, what's the transfer case on it? I'm assuming you guys upgraded this. So I don't want to butcher this part. Adam knows better than I do. He called me one day after all of his extensive research and he was like, look, if we were to get, and it was some like older, I'm, I'm talking old, like 80s model Land Cruiser transfer case. He's like, then you'd have another shifter for it. And you'd have an easier low range than the factory one. And my answer was, you had me at another shifter. Because to me, if it had seven shifters in there, the better. It just looks cool. That's all I want, all this like yeah. old steampunk looking, like what options do you want? I want to have all these choices. So what we ended up with is that older transfer case, but then also the Taco Box, which is an off the shelf product for late model Tacomas that, uh, Marlin from Marlin Crawler that just gives you that super low gearing. And it's awesome. Now, I'm assuming that this truck got the name Sloth because of that transfer case. Right? That's right. That, that's the plan. Though. And you did a little, uh, you actually featured it not too long ago where you were accelerating it. Yeah, floor it, and it can go a tenth of a mile an hour. Yeah. It's yeah. super cool. Which is also why the graphics have the crazy little Sloth. The original vision was kind of a play on the SRT Hellcat. I mean, those guys taking the Challengers and they got the huge Gotti sticker on there with the head of the Hellcat or the Demon. And I dig it. Yeah, you've got the power. You've got a 700 horsepower motor. Go ahead, stick that big old sticker on there. Well, I want to do kind of a mocking of that with a sloth head, but in the same size, same orientation with this little evil sloth moving forward because theirs is fast, mine is slow. Well, all the graphic was gonna be on the door. And once we had these tube doors, we all knew those real doors are never going back on this thing. So we had to abort on that, flip the graphic, shrink it so it could all fit on the bed. But it still totally works. And you know, that's why it says 272 to one above it. <laughs> so if you're wondering like, where, why sloth? And you'd be like, oh, it's got a low crawl ratio. Even then, nobody's gonna know what their truck has to compare it to, yeah. but take my word for it, 272 it's is low. low. It's low, dude. That's crazy. All right, let's move on to your interior mods. Tell me a little bit about this custom uh, center console and why you guys decided to go this route. Well, the center console from day one was supposed to be the defining feature of the entire build. And it's on the inside. I mean, you look at this truck, it's obviously ridiculous, over the top crowd pleaser. But you can pull off that look in a lot of ways and not necessarily have all the capability that this one does. What I wanted was on that, you know, we talked about phase three, phase one's from 100 yards. 
phase two is when it's close and phase three is digging into the details. I knew that if we had tube doors on this and you're at a SEMA or something where you've got all these gear heads, thousands of dudes coming to check it out, the second they peeked over the door, they were gonna see that console and go, oh my God, you did that on a 2019 to have all the shifters and the super low range transfer case? That's just so cool. So everything about this is kind of a, it's an old Toyota rock crawler wearing 2019 skins. That was the objective and working with Southern, we totally nailed that. That's awesome, it looks, it looks incredible. Yeah, it's so clean what they did with the fiberglass. I don't even know how they'd start that console. The wheel is also different. What did you guys do there? So, I'll take a little credit for this one because at first Adam was like, nah, you don't need to change the steering wheel, let's leave it. Well, I've had a lot of cars with full hydro steering. The problem with a full hydraulic steering off an orbital is, you think about the design, if it didn't have a bypass overflow, you would basically destroy your components. Because when you get to a full lock and you keep steering, it's a ram. It wants to just smash through anything. Well, when your axles have locked out or the ram has hit its full extension, the fluid's got to go somewhere when the valve is open. And the valve is open if you're steering. So what it does is it lets a bypass leak. It's a long way of telling you that steering wheel is always drifting. And so up is not always up. And if you had the factory steering wheel, it would look real dorky in a show if you walked up on it and the wheels are straight and the steering wheel is completely upside down. And so I was like, we've got to go with a quick connect. He agreed, it turns out sick looking. Anything else in the interior that we might be missing? I know that you have an incredible sound system in there as well. Yeah, and I might butcher it. Let's call it two tens, but whatever's behind the seats, major boom boom. It, I mean, it thumps, but that was kind of some of the irony we got laughing at when we took the doors off the first time. We did not realize that 100% of the speakers are in the door. But again, Jeep is what you think of with tube doors. And since they were designed to have the doors removed, the Jeep's internal speakers are in like above yeah. the B pillar and up uh, underneath the windshield. So you still had music. This thing had zero. And so... Only the bass. And Adam went ahead and designed a way to integrate speakers to our door. Not only that would work, but in true Southern Off-Road fashion, they found a way to utilize the OE plug. We are going to, down the road, make a hinge kit, which is an upgrade to these doors that would allow both your factory door and this door to go more Jeep style pin. So it's easy on, easy off. Well, the other thing that Jeep has going for it, because it's designed that way, quick connect for the locks, you know, your factory doors got the windows and powered mirrors. So it's got the umbilical, albeit not easy because they didn't ever think someone was gonna take them off. Yeah. Once you've got it figured out, you can get to where that's quick on and off. But we want our tube doors to be able to do the same thing and be a quick plug, so. That's gonna be awesome. It I will be. I can't wait to rock that. That's kind of really cool. Yeah, dudes are going to freak for these tube doors, man. I mean, it's, it's tough. You got to live in an environment that doesn't rain a lot, or it better be an extra car and in a garage. Because same thing goes for Jeep people. They normally run tube doors in that season, but you got to be able to park in the garage because you just can't predict the weather. Yeah. And if it's your daily driver. Safety also. Like yep, theft. Yeah. There's nothing protecting it. So. It's going to be a cool summer. But when you have it, as you attested today, all of a sudden, yeah, it looks like a 2019 taco inside, free. but you feel like you're in a you buggy like, yeah, or a total free. race truck. It's, it's awesome for cruising down the road. Power system and electronics, have you done anything to it? Nope, uh, Not, nothing the behind the, the amps. The S-Pod connected to the rock. Yeah, and it does have that, you're right. Keep it simple. I don't know if that's an S-Pod brand, but whatever it is, those do come in handy. So under the hood, the wiring's easier. What about the performance in the engine? You said that it stayed basically bone stock. That's right. Stock. Keep it simple. I did have Adam change the muffler, and it's like, just keep it simple. I want it to, I want to know it's got exhaust, but knowing it's kind of an underpowered taco, I don't want it poppy or loud. And so I ended up just going with a dumped muffler. 
Yeah. And when I said dumped, I envisioned a little down pipe. He literally just left it as the round tube coming out, which I kind of like now. It's like, all right. And take. is the muffler a specific brand that you just said? Uh, I can't recall. No. He had tested a couple. It's not like a Flowmaster or some like known Borla. I think it's just some local exhaust shop muffler that he knew works good with this size truck. All right, man, let's go into a little, let's go deeper into these Fab Four two doors. These things are amazing. It is, and it's a little bit of the catalyst to this build. I knew those tube doors were kind of going to be one of, one of the wow products that we were going to have in 2020. Uh, yeah, 2020 has changed a little bit and from a priority <laughs> perspective, but that was another reason like, you know what, it's okay to go big on this build because it's going to be a platform to show these new doors. They're, they're radical. I mean, like I said earlier, from if you had a whole bunch of different brainstorming, nobody was going to go this wild. So out of the gates, for the few you know trusted industry folks, um, we were putting it out there and saying, "Don't hurt. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I promise. Just tell me what you think. You know, lay it on me. Give me the honest feedback." And universally, 100%, people love it. So there was that, and then there's just been you know vendors in here. The snack machine guy I asked him, "Hey, what do you think about those?" Like those are ridiculous. Yeah. Not once was somebody like, well, I'd rather have, you know, what you think of as a traditional tube door, not one. It looks, it looks like something out of this world, man. Yeah. And that's the reason I do things like that, like the Grumper we've had, these real polarizing products. I always want a love or hate. I'll take that any day over plain vanilla because Look, there's a commitment to running these taco tube doors. Tacomas weren't built to have no doors. They're not built to have rain in on the carpet. You know, there's not a carpet delete on Tacomas because nobody's ever thought of it for that. So when you're into this, this is gonna be down to like the loyal, hardcore taco lovers. The guy that lives, eats, sleeps, breathes tacos. And for that guy who's already deeply passionate about his build, I want him to be either all in, like I will have those tube doors from Fab Fours come hell or high water, I don't care, get me a set. Or somebody's like, ah, those don't even look right on there. Yeah. Like, then don't get them, good. Because I need somebody who's so madly in love with them, they're willing to deal with right having two sets of doors and the, the effort it takes to put them on. And you know what? Hey, if I have to yank my carpet out after it gets moldy because I get caught in the rain, so be it. I'm having these doors because you've sat in it. You can't go back. It like, feels like you're free. The experience of driving in them will now make all the detriments worth it. But you got to be passionate. And so that's where I like a pretty wild design. That's a love-hate. Come to find out, so far it's been love, 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 love. But if you hate it, tell us, because I'm curious. You know, I want to see a picture of your Tacoma and why you don't like these doors. And I can then make my own reverse judgments to see if you're qualified to give us your opinion. So that'll be fun to just kind of see, you know, what you think about this. Can you park it inside? Does your taco fit in the garage right now? Or does it already have a tent? And so you're like, hey, I'd love it, but I got to park outside. What am I gonna do in the rain? I don't have security. It's something that you're gonna use like in the summertime. Yeah, I mean, if you live in Phoenix. You're good. You're good. You got all summer, as long as, you know, from a security, yeah, it's still open. You can't leave your sunglasses on the dash, you know, cause you park it to run into the mall. It's just sitting there, it's an open Tacoma. I mean, these doors you can reach over. I mean, there's no lock on it anyways. Like a Polaris, like it's the door of the Yep, Polaris. exactly. But, Again, it doesn't matter. For the whole list of cons that somebody can come up with, sit in it, drive it, and you'll say, I don't care if there was a thousand things on the cons. The pro is, I must have this. Yeah. So. I felt it, guys, and it was awesome. I need to get a set of these on our truck, especially to go out in Moab and just feel free. Yeah, and where you guys can help me out from a feedback in the comments, you know, I don't know the size of the market for guys that can actually legitimately handle this. Like that can park in the garage, that can deal with the weather, but you're out there. There's enough of you. 
but how many? Because the catch 22 is I've got to see the market adopt these doors before I can invest as a business that next phase of development because we're talking, you know, expensive molds or others to make this new hinge mechanism. Yep. But it's going to make the tube door owning experience that much easier because if you do it, you're going to have doors. Ours are sitting over there in a crate your factory doors, you're going to want to swap them. And if I can make that easier on the truck owner, that's just going to make it more accessible to more owners. But chicken and egg, I can't invest in that development if the total market for these tube doors in the world's 400 guys and I get all 400 are so hardcore, they can deal with it anyways. But if, if it's like, I would do that if I could change my doors in 15 minutes, you know, give me a goal, set a target out there and if we have something to hit and we feel like there's enough of a movement from these loyal taco guys, I have the means. I can make that door work that way. And we'll do it. We'll pull it off. If you're game, we're game. So don't forget guys, make sure to leave a comment on the comment section down below. Let us know your honest opinion on these doors. Yep, I can handle it. Give us the truth. And how long did it take you guys to build it to where it is today from the day you purchased the Tacoma up until now? I would say tip to tail, he was about five weeks. So five weeks, five weeks. And a lot of that's still waiting on parts. And oh, this little thing, uh, you might remember coronavirus. Yeah. So his main fabricator builder had actually gone overseas just to see his family. And then the whole thing hit. And so he got stuck even getting back in the country and quarantined. And even then, it was five weeks. Even then. You yep. heard that? Make five weeks to build that thing. That's crazy. That's nuts. How much was the total cost for this thing? Would you be able to share that with us? What was the total cost? It is up there. Um, Would you say is that $200,000 to come $100,000? Nah, I'd put it in the $100,000. 100000 yep. range? Like that Chimera, that thing got out of hand. You know, that started with... Oh, I'm going to save money and get these $5,000 axles. Well, it's nearly a quarter million dollar build. But it's a total showstopper. You know, this Tacoma, again, factory running gear. You know, if you dropped in a cammed out LS7 and a, I mean, it would be sick, but it would, you know, there's another $30,000. Do you plan to ever engine swap it at all? I hope not. <laughs> I like the reliability of it. But we'll see, the you know, could you. it could. And I admitted to you earlier off camera, I want it to be a little lower, I think, in the gearing. Oh, so, we might see it a little so it's 272 to one right now. I feel like I could handle even lower. There's just something about watching a tire on an obstacle move this fast. Yeah. Because what it's happens, just it's just wrinkling and you can just, I connect with the tire. I love watching a sticky do its thing. It's almost like wearing, if you've ever been indoor rock climbing or done it with your body on the ropes, you know, you get the special solo shoes, they're real tight and you smear them on the rock and you can take the littlest crystal and get the traction to hold your whole body. Well, when a rig's out on the rocks, typically what happens, I mean, rock crawling, it's a great equalizer. It's gravity versus traction. Those are the only two components on top of driver skill to pick a good line. But what's getting you up that is, can you put that traction to lift this weight? This is no svelte being with these big axles. I don't know what this taco weighs, but it's probably 5,000 pounds. You know, it's heavy with all that armor. So to put this on, if you didn't have that low gearing, you're gonna see somebody trying to get up it and it's gonna spin. Every time the tire spins, you've broken traction, you've given it away. So at that point, you're either in Bumpville, where you're gonna back up two feet and your whole goal is to move the momentum, bump over the obstacle and embrace the spinning tires. Well, what I wanna do is just watch it work. I wanna see lug by lug, th a thump off, thump off. They're like, come on, baby. And you just give it the slightest turn because it's so controlled. Thump, thump, and you try a little left, thump, thump, a little right thump, grab. And right when that grabs, that's it. That's euphoria. That's rock crawling. You've done it. 
And if everybody else was whopping over it and you get to walk up and single finger steer, and it's like, and you're like, damn, you crawled it. It's like the opposite of what you think. You think that the, the winner is the guy that just smashed up it. No way. The adoration of everyone there is like, man, you crawled that. You didn't even spin a tire. So that's what the taco's for. And that's why I'm gonna love wheeling this thing for years to come. That's awesome, man. Well, Greg, thank you so much for having us, man. Let's do a little- You got bit it. Uh, well, Corona, tires. goodbye. Goodbye. Okay. Thanks, dude. Till the trails. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed that video. If you're interested in checking out the Fab Force facility tour, then make sure to click up here. You guys wanna see Greg's entrepreneurial story on how he built this American manufacturing facility, then make sure to click up here. Don't forget to like this video. If you haven't subscribed, make sure to do so. I'll see you guys in the next video.